gracing our stage for his third talk on the main stage. As, and this is an exciting talk for him because uh, although he has done three talks for us already, one of them was on a ship. So this is the third talk on the main stage, which we will explain later. Um, I'm very excited to invite Skylar Earl to the stage. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it's not the first time. So uh, I just want to start out this talk by giving a shout out to my mom, who, unlike me, is an actual colonial American historian. Uh, I just want to say thanks, mom. I guess the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, so if if you studied the history of uh, America in school, you, you probably learned about Plymouth or Jamestown. But the first English settlement in the New World actually arrived a generation earlier. Isn't that a bit mysterious? <laughs> in fact, the story of the Roanoke Colony is actually shrouded in many layers of mystery, some of which we will talk about tonight. The first is, is why it took the English so long to get here. By the late 1500s, the Spanish had already destroyed the Inca and the Aztec civilizations, and they had been hauling fabulous wealth back to Europe for almost a century. Now, in contrast to Spain, England was disorganized and weak, the Protestant faith had only recently been established, and the throne had just passed to an unlikely young woman with a tenuous hold on power, a queen named Elizabeth. For most of Elizabeth's reign, the crown lacked the resources to gamble on colonies in the New World. However, Elizabeth was only too happy to allow her subjects to take on the risks themselves, if only to spite her Catholic rivals in Spain. One such subject was Walter Raleigh, a dashing young gentleman who captured the queen's favor with his ambition and his charm. <laughs> Look at that guy. So the second mystery related to England's earlier colonial aspirations was why the hell Walter Raleigh chose to start out not in a reasonable place like the Chesapeake Bay with its many protected inlets and deep harbors for shipping, but no, they started out in the outer banks of the Carolinas, a place of treacherous shoals and unreliable weather, uh, which later came to be known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. So the answer may lie... Oh, wait, it gets better. It gets better. So the answer may lie in, uh, in the, the closer proximity of the Outer Banks to the major Spanish trade routes, which made it ideal as a base for privateering. And if those of you who attended uh, Casey's special edition Odd Salon tall ship thing, you may recall I have a special fondness for privateering, uh, if those of you who remember. Uh, so privateering was basically a kind of state-sanctioned piracy in which the private naval fleets were licensed by the English crown to prey on Spanish shipping. This was a way to get rich quick if you were both violent and lucky. So privateering was kind of the, the dot-com industry of 16th century England. Too soon. Too soon. Yeah, I went there. So, so, so Sir Walter sent a flotilla in 1585 to the Outer Banks under uh, one Arthur Barlow to see what was what. Of his first glimpse of America, Barlow said, quote, we found such plenty that I think in all the world that the like abundance is not to be found. Uh, the expedition also met the Native Americans who were living there. Uh, these people were members of the Algonquian culture, uh, and they were organized in small towns with very efficient farming and fishing practices. Barlow described them as, quote, very handsome and goodly people, and in their behavior as mannerly and civil as any in Europe. Uh, the reports from the first voyage encouraged Raleigh to send a permanent mission to what is now called what he now called Virginia in uh, 1586. And most of the maps in this talk uh, and the watercolor paintings are actually uh, were made by an artist on that voyage by the name of John White, and he will come back into this story shortly. This expedition had mixed results. The colony's food supplies were lost en route, so the settlers wound up living off the generosity of the Native Americans. Meanwhile, the English somehow expected that the Americans would instantly recognize the superiority of English culture and of the Protestant faith and instantly adopt both. Yeah. Needless to say, no such thing actually happened, but the high-handed behavior of the English rapidly led to open violence. So, so basically now the English, they have no food, they pissed off the Native Americans who are the only people feeding them. They don't even know when the next supply ship is going to... The, the only thing that saved the English at this point was the unexpected arrival of Sir Francis Drake, who was just coming back from a successful privateering mission, and he offered to cart most of the colonists safely back to England. And so they left 15 men behind to garrison Roanoke Island until another expedition could be mounted the following spring. Still, 
Raleigh's enthusiasm for colonization remained undimmed. The, the two journeys had brought back promising commodities to England for the first time, such as tobacco. And, uh, and the lure of profit still seemed really tantalizingly close. So in uh, 1587, uh, Raleigh sent another fleet bearing over 100 colonists, including women and children, with the artist John White at their head. And the plan was to pick up the garrison at Roanoke and then go to the Chesapeake Bay to find a better place to settle. <laughs> so the next mystery in this story concerns why White and the colonists never made it that far. Right? Well, the answer is, it turns out, ships. Uh, <laughs> actually, the answer is privateering. And the reason why... <laughs> it's pirates. <laughs> Yeah, basically, so, so the, the ships left England late, then they got into lousy weather, and they didn't actually reach Roanoke until late in July. Um, so meanwhile, the privateering season was already drawing to a close, and lugging colonists around the Atlantic was not exactly a lucrative uh, proposition. So whatever reason, uh, for whatever reason, the fleet's officers decided that the colonists were getting off at Roanoke Island, and uh, they were not taking no for an answer. Uh, and so the colonists were settling Roanoke Island, whether they liked it or not. <laughs> Uh, so the only good bit of news in this entire fiasco emerged for White. Uh, his daughter, Eleanor, who had come over with her husband, gave birth uh, shortly after their arrival to a little girl, uh, who became the first person of English descent to be born in the New World. Her name, you may have heard, was Virginia Dare. Now, with the year far too advanced for planting crops, with Native relations already in bad shape, and given that they weren't even supposed to be on Roanoke in the first place, the colonists were like, White, you got to go back to England and send help, because this is a mess. So White acquiesced. Uh, he left instructions that if the settlers needed to relocate from Roanoke Island for whatever reason, that they should post their intended destination prominently somewhere, and that they should add, if they, if they want, ran into trouble, they should add a Maltese cross to indicate that their departure was done under duress. Now, White would not return to Virginia for three years, and the day that he left was the last that anyone knew definitively the whereabouts of the Roanoke colonists. Indeed. So the, the next mystery, of course, is why did it take White three years to come back? The answer has actually a pretty straightforward answer. It can be summed up in three words. Those three words are the Spanish Armada. <laughs> uh, so basically, Philip of Spain got fed up with all of this privateering. He assembled the largest invasion fleet that anybody had ever seen. All English shipping was held back in defense of the realm. England did not get invaded, but that's another story. Uh, so White was finally permitted to leave for America late the following year, but again, the ship's crew were more interested in privateering than in colonizing. They picked a fight with the wrong ship. They barely made it back to England with their lives. So as for Raleigh, he basically abandoned the Roanoke colony at this point. Um, so his inaction after 1590 is 1589 is like kind of a mystery, uh, but he fell out of favor with uh, Elizabeth in 1591 and was eventually executed for treason. So he may have had other things on his mind. For his part, White kept trying. In 1590, he got passage on another privateering voyage. He finally reached the Outer Banks in August. And uh, after they spent, a, basically they wasted a day investigating what they thought was a signal fire uh, on the mainland. It just turned out to be a wildfire. Uh, White and company finally reached Roanoke Island in a growing storm to find the settlement completely deserted. So the only thing that they found, the only evidence that they found was inscribed on a tree nearby the name of Croatoan and on another tree nearby, simply the letters C-R-O. Now, neither inscription had a cross to indicate emergency, and in fact, it wasn't just the settlers who were gone. It seemed as if the entire settlement had been disassembled and moved elsewhere. So White's company decided that the markings referred to nearby Croatoan Island, uh, which is today known as Hatteras Island, uh, and they set out for it the next day. Uh, but the storm had worsened, and the first boat that they sent to Croatoan uh, was actually lost with several sailors on board. So at this point, the remaining mariners on this voyage were like, we'd rather be out in the ocean privateering. And they, they just, they, they took off against White's protests. Uh, and so once again, the lure of privateering proved to be a cause both of Roanoke's existence and also of its eventual disappearance. Coincidentally, White left America for the last time on what would have been uh, Dare's, uh, Virginia Dare's third birthday. Uh, and he, he never made it back. He was never able to return. So we're left with all these questions, right? Like, Things could have been totally different. What would have happened if the colonists had been allowed to settle in the Chesapeake? What if the Spanish Armada hadn't threatened invasion? What if White's first attempt to return to Virginia hadn't ended in failure? What if Raleigh had actually sent a proper relief expedition? What if White's second attempt hadn't been delayed by one day and they had gotten to Croatoan Island before the storm had, uh, had arrived? What would they have found when they got there? And the answer is we may never know. Um, the fate of the Roanoke colonists has fascinated the curious ever since. The first sincere efforts to find them were made by the Jamestown settlers in 1607, probably because the mystery of the Roanoke colony may have weighed heavily on their minds. 
indeed. Uh, one theory is that the Roanoke colony was destroyed. One theory is that they were destroyed by the Spanish, but it turns out, this is possible but unlikely, the detailed records left by the Spanish indicate that into the 1600s, they were in fact looking for an English colony in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, an English explorer in the Carolinas in the late 17th century reported hearing rumors that the Native American leader known as Powhatan claimed to have captured and killed settlers, but this story was never substantiated. And in any event, it was not the practice of the Algonquians to just kill women and children. So if this claim were true, it's actually likely that some of the settlers still survived. Uh, a, another theory uh, is that the relations between the Roanoke settlers and the Algonquians ended not in war, but in peace. It's possible that the Americans just invited their hapless English neighbors to simply take up residence with them, and the grateful colonists agreed to do so. This would have been possible because the Algonquins were not a bunch of goddamn bigoted racists. Uh, <laughs> it turns out, and they were willing to kind of take people uh, for what they did rather than what they were. Um, and there are actually many, many documented historical examples of people of European descent going to live with Native American societies and becoming fully integrated. So this is possible, but we have no documentation. Rumors persisted throughout the 17th and 18th centuries of tribes of fair-haired, gray-eyed Indians lurking in the Cal Carolinas. And into the 19th century, uh, efforts were afoot to connect one or another Native American nation with the Roanoke settlers, but none of these have succeeded definitively because the last four centuries have offered plenty of opportunity for intermarriage between Europeans and Native Americans. So we just we have no way of knowing for certain. Uh, evidence concerning the Roanoke colonists continues to surface over the years, and all of it is circumstantial. We have here, for example, the Dare Stones, which surfaced in 1937. They were purported to be uh, Eleanor Dare's diary, and make it long story short, they're a hoax. <laughs> uh, so about five, it, gets, it just gets weirder than this, though. Like, so five years ago, some researchers uh, noticed that John White's map from 1588 had this strange patch on the left. And they, they shone a light from back 400 years. Somebody was like, what if we shine a light from behind it? And they revealed this star-shaped feature. Oh, it's kind of hard to make out with the contrast. The star-shaped feature underneath the patch on the left. And then weirder still, the patch itself appears to also show this kind of fortification feature on this location in the map in invisible ink. <laughs> what, uh, right, what, like, what is, what was White trying to either conceal or record? No idea. There's literally no idea. And this is Roanoke for you, right? This is Roanoke for you. Like, it's just, the, we, clues keep popping up once every few centuries, and we're still no closer to actually solving the mystery. And the, the Roanoke colonists continue to exert this kind of peculiar hold on the American imagination. Uh, Virginia Dare herself has been kind of imagining countless novels and stage plays, television shows as a heroine, a victim, a love interest, a ghost, uh, an alien abductee, uh, and even a vampire. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. So the, the mysterious fate of Virginia and the Roanoke colonists kind of becomes this quintessential blank slate onto which generations of Americans have poured every conceivable narrative. Uh, the supposed location of the colony on Roanoke Island is now a national park in North Carolina that you can and should visit, but John White did not find the colonists there and probably neither will we. Uh, and the, the, to me, the biggest mystery in all of this and the thing that haunts me that I keep coming back to when I think about this story is if they lived that long, right, the Roanoke colonists must have had this moment where they realized that they, they had been abandoned and that nobody was coming to rescue them. And what must they have thought? And what must they have felt in that moment? And what must they have decided to do? So, a toast to Virginia Dare and the colonists to Roanoke. Thank you. I would like to invite Casey Selden up on stage for a, a wee little uh, ceremony that we like to do. Hey, everybody. Hi. Fun fact, I'm not as tall as everyone else on this stage right now. Um, also, I grew up in Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, pretty much every school field trip that I ever went on was based around this story here, which you told very beautifully. And my grandfather wrote an outdoor theater production that's still running decades later about it. My grandfather did. Yeah, I read all about it. So um, next time you want to take Avenger Harvey on a trip, make sure it's in the summertime in, in Mosquito Country. Um, it'll be great. <laughs> Skylar. Um, we have a tradition here in the Odd Salon community that after three or four talks, you get invited to be a part of our community, but it is not required. Um, it's elective. <laughs> so I need to ask right now, will you accept our pin? I would just like to say this is probably the deepest honor I've been offered all year, at least. I, I really appreciate it. 
Y'all are fantastic, and it's such an honor to, to be uh, among you and to share all these wonderful stories with you. So thank you. Yes, please, and thank you. Thank you all very much. This is this is really quite an honor. I appreciate it. And thanks for listening. Take care.